Hello, my name is Rick West, and I'd like to welcome you to the National Museum of the American Indian. It is my good fortune to be director of the museum, which is right across from the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. I'm also a Native American, a Southern Cheyenne, and member of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma. I'm delighted to be the first to invite you into our brand new museum to explore some of the exciting traditions and cultures of the native peoples of the Western Hemisphere. Today you are going to see dancing from Alaska, hear some wonderful Hawaiian singing, visit our exhibitions, explore the grounds of the museum, which will remind you of a real native landscape. You will also learn how to make and play a flute the way the Aymara Indians do in Bolivia. If you're lucky, you might even see some of the ducks who now live in the wetlands area in front of the museum. Thank you for joining us today. Enjoy your trip. And remember that this is where America's heritage begins. Good afternoon or good morning wherever you are across this country today and welcome to the live interactive electronic field trip sponsored by Ball State University, Best Buy Children's Foundation and the National Museum of the American Indian. I'm Glenn Augustine from Ball State University and we are in the Potomac area of the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington DC. Tansai Logan. What I said was he hello in Cree, my language. My name is Logan. I go, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm in fifth grade and I go to Indian Community School. Logan, you say you go to Indian Community School. Are all the children there Cree? No. How many different tribes are represented there? About 14. 14 different tribes. All right, well, we are inside, as I said, the Potomac area of the National Museum of the American Indian. This is a brand new museum. This museum just opened when, Logan? September 21st. That's right, September 21st. It's located on the National Mall near the, the U.S. Capitol building. There you see the groundbreaking and some of the construction for this building. When you see the buildings outside, it looks like a natural landscape, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Tell me about the way it's curved a little bit. It's curved by, some people say it's curved by wind and water because it looks like there's waves on the walls, like wind and water. When the wind connects to the water, it makes waves. Right, so the building is shaped like a natural uh, mesa that you might see out in the American Southwest, and it is looks like it's shaped by wind and water. So we are going to be talking today to a number of people around the inside of the museum, right? Right. All right, where are we going to go first? Who are we going to check in with? We're going to check in with Cynthia, Cynthia right? and John. And where are they? They're in the um, Pumunky exhibit. exhibit. Yeah, let's go upstairs. Hi, Glenn and Logan. Hello. Uh, I'm Cynthia Chavez, and I'm from San Felipe Pueblo, New Mexico. I'm an associate curator with the museum, and today I'm in the Our Lives exhibit space in the um, Pamunkey community section with a student from Wisconsin, and I'll let him introduce himself. Say you, John Yugas, only one Sagag Yinyata. What I said was hello in Oneida, and my, my name is John, or is that that's what they call me, and I'm Turtle Clan, and I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Later today, we'll be talking about Pamunkey pottery and the Kalinago community. Okay, we'll be checking in with those guys a little later on. We also have another group up inside the museum, right? Jared and Hannah. I do believe 
believe that they're in the... Um, they are in the Mapuche exhibit. The Mapuche exhibit. Hi, Glenn. Hi, Logan. My name is Jared. I'm Navajo from New Mexico, and I work here in the museum, and I'm also here with a student from Oklahoma. Hi, I'm Hannah Wapai harris I'm from northern Oklahoma, and I'm half Kickapoo. Hannah, can you tell us today where we're at in the museum? We're in the... Mapuche. Mapuche mm -hmm. exhibit in the our universe gallery. Now, Hannah, where are the Mapuche located? They're located in southern Chile. Southern Chile, also in parts of Argentina. Can you explain just a little bit real quickly about the object that you see behind us? It's the Rewi, and it's the center of the universe for the Mapuche, and they have, it's every, in the Mapuche universe, they have uh, the Machi, who are the healers, and they, each Machi gets one in there. That's correct, Hannah. Just one more. Why do we include the Mapuche here in the museum? Because the museum is a hemispheric place, and it has everyone in the Western Hemisphere. hemisphere. That's right. Back to you, Glenn. Okay, just to expound on what the Western Hemisphere is, that's everybody in the Americas, from the Arctic Circle down to the tip of South America, Tierra del Fuego. So we're talking about native peoples across North, Central, and South America, right? Right. And we have one more group with us here today. Who's that? Dwayne and Athena that are outside. Hi, you guys. Hi, how you doing? Uh, hi, my name is Dwayne Blue Spruce. I'm from Laguna and San Juan Pueblo in New Mexico. I'm an architect and facilities planning coordinator with the National Museum of the American Indian. And I'm joined today by Athena. Athena, would you like to introduce yourself? Buju Athena, an indigenous Kazni Nishnabe Makwanirudim. What I said in my Ojibwe language was hello, my name is Athena, my tribe is Ojibwe, and my clan is Bear. And we're both standing outside the museum in the landscape area, and today we're going to be talking about the four cardinal direction markers, which are special stones that have been placed outside the museum in the landscape. Back to you, Glenn and Logan. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. We'll be talking to you again later. Now, we also want to hear from you, you students who are out there across the United States today. This is your field trip as much as it is Logan's field trip. So we want to hear from you. And, Logan, how can they check in with us? Well, you could call the number at the bottom of your screen, or you can email us also at the bottom of your screen, or you could just check out the website. And if you, and if you don't check out the website but still email us and you have a question, one of our experts will tell you will answer your question. That's right. And if you call in, we may be able to take your question live on the air, right? Right. All right. So please get involved, interact, call in or email in because this is your field trip. We're here to try to answer your questions. And what's one of the early activities we're going to be doing that we hope students will share with us? Um the family statement. That's right. If you have already written a family statement and would like to share it with us here and with children across the country, we would encourage you to call in now because we're going to be getting to those family statements in just a few minutes. So it's time to kick off the show. It's time to uh, learn what it means to be Native. As I said, we're standing here inside the Potomac area, and right here at our feet are some stones that are divided into four sections. And Logan, if you can, please tell me. We're going to get a shot of these stones. What do these stones represent? These stones represent the north, south, east, and west, or in other words, the cardinal directions. The cardinal directions. Okay, we're going to be focusing a lot on the cardinal directions today. And one of the cardinal directions, the east, is where we're going to start today. And what is interesting about the east direction when you also think about the museum? Well, actually, the east entrance is the main entrance. And that's the same way that the sun rises in the morning. So it's like it's greeting the museum. Okay, and uh, also, why is the museum here on the National Mall? Because there was Native Americans here around this area. And, and if you look all around here, there are very many different museums. But there is not one specifically made for Native Americans. So I thought, I thought it was pretty special that they made one just right here. Speaking of special, you're wearing something special around your neck today. Why don't you tell me what this is? This is a, a medicine pouch that my whole entire class gave to me. And what is inside the medicine pouch? Um, all four... <laughs> Yeah, all four medicines. And what are the four medicines? Sage, sweetgrass, cedar, and tobacco. Okay, we might talk about those a little bit more later on. Let's take a look around the museum a little bit as we try to give you a little bit of a video tour of what you would see if you came here to the National Museum of the American Indian. The Our Universe area is one of the exhibits here, and various communities talk about their universe and how they relate to the world around them. 
not only through history, but also through today. So if you were to visit this part of the museum, you would see how these eight communities reflect life in our universe. There's also the Our People's Exhibit uh, here at the museum. The moon plays a big role in uh, many Native cultures. But the, this area here shows some of the items that show that American Indians and Natives were here long before Columbus discovered America in 1492. The gold and silver represent power. They, didn't, they weren't used for money back then. The uh, Art People's Exhibit also focuses on communities that are alive and thriving today. And that's one of the really interesting uh, aspects to this museum. This is not just about Native American or Indian history. It's also about how people are thriving across this country, across Canada, in South and Central America, even today. So as you went up, go about the museum, you would learn from about 24 different communities they have in here right now. And through the years, the, community, the communities will actually change. So more communities will be represented here in the museum. All right. We are now going to go to uh, one of our other hosts here, and that's Jenny. And Jenny's going to talk to us a little more about what it means to be native and in a native place. Hey, thanks, Glenn. I actually want to introduce some of the other students that we have here with us today. Uh, as Glenn said, my name is Jenny. I work here at the museum in the education office. And I'm a member of the Osage tribe, which is in northeastern Oklahoma. Uh, the other students here, I have Casey. Casey, why don't you introduce yourself? My name is Casey Gatt. I'm a member of the Cree clan in Manitoba, Canada. Cree Tribe, and I go to any community school in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Great. Thanks for being here, Casey. This is BJ. BJ, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi. My name is BJ Shaffer. So I'm in the seventh grade. I go to Irving Middle School in Norman, Oklahoma. And we also have Amanda here. Amanda, tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Amanda Cavola, and I go to Irving Middle School in the seventh grade in Norman, Oklahoma. Great. Thanks. Um, we're going to be in the Potomac area today, as Glenn said. We have a lot of things that are going to happen. We have some activities that we're going to do, some dancing and some music. We also have behind us here a group of sixth grade students from Hardy Middle School here in Washington, D.C. So we're so glad that they're here with us to help us with this electronic field trip today. One thing that Glenn said we're going to talk about is what makes this museum a native place. How is the museum a native place? Um, this museum is actually, in all things that the museum does, everything from the design of the building, the landscape outside, the exhibitions inside, and uh, the, even the food in the cafeteria was all done with uh, input from Native people from across the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we have uh, communities that we worked with and got their input on what they thought this building should be about, what the museum should say. And so this museum really does have a Native voice and a Native perspective here. Uh, in, in all of the different aspects and components of the museum. We're going to learn a little bit more about that today. But we also want to talk about what it means to be Native. And as I mentioned before, I'm a member of the Osage tribe, which is from northeastern Oklahoma. Although my tribe is from Oklahoma, I grew up in Colorado. So I grew up in my family. It was very important to us to maintain connected and stay connected to our uh, traditions and the customs in Oklahoma. And so each summer we go back for our dances and we visit our relatives and we see friends and family that we haven't seen for a while. And it's very important to us to maintain that connection to the past and to our, to our grandparents and to those who came before us. And so for me, that's what it means to be Native. It means it's the importance of staying connected to who you are and where you're from and, and recognizing that and making sure this is a part of your everyday life. And so that's why I'm so proud to work here at the National Museum of the American Indian. We all, I also wanted to ask Casey, Casey, maybe you could tell us a little bit about, for you, what it means to you to be Native American. Um, it pretty much means a lot what you said, Jenny, of how you got to keep um, in touch with, like, where your tribe is and your family that's back on wherever your reservation is. And we go, my family goes up to my, where my family is, like, every two years. And we go to the powwows and things like that. And have a good time and we see a lot of relatives that we haven't seen in a long time. Great, so your family and staying connected to where you're from is important to you also. Let's try to see if maybe Jared can help give us an answer too. Jared, do you want to tell us a little bit about what it means to you to be a Native American person? Hi, Jenny. That's a really good question. Actually, Hannah, can you uh, provide some insight into that? Well, it's really special to me because when I go to Powers, I, get, I think it gets me close to my family and I get to spend more time with them. That's absolutely right. And for me, Jenny, it really means my community in Nash City, New Mexico, and it's really about not forgetting where I come from. 
these answers are, are right. There isn't really one definition of what a Native American person is. Each Native person uh, sort of defines themselves a little bit for, for their, their, their own background and for, for who they think they are. And even sometimes, you might notice today, we use different terms. Some people say Native American, some people say American Indian, or Indian, or Native, or Indigenous person. And all of these are terms that can be used uh, to, to describe or to talk about Native people. And as you heard us all mention, we're from specific communities. So Casey's Cree, and I'm Osage. Jared it said that he is Navajo. And so all of these answers that everybody gave are, are, are right. They're correct. Um, uh, some of you out in your classrooms might have done a lesson or a, put together your family statements. If you, if you have family statements, pull those out. And some of you maybe can call into the, to the phone and we can hear, you can share your family statements with us. But while we're, while we're waiting for that, Casey wrote a family statement here. And I'd like to ask Casey if you could read your statement for us. Sure. Okay. I brought a piece of a tree. This piece of a tree represents my family because on a tree, there are many branches that are near each other and those that are not. There are members of my family that are close to each other and those are not. I have a large family, like a tree with many branches. Some are old and some are young. We may all be spread out, but we are also connected down to our roots, just like a tree. That's great, Casey. So when you worked on your family statement, was there anybody in your family that you talked to to help you come up with this statement? I talked to my mom because a, family's, a tree is very big, and my family is very big, so it kind of paired off there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And your mom thought that the tree would be a good, good example of an object to bring. Where did you get this piece of tree that you brought in? Well, I'm pretty sure my mom got this from one of her really close friends with, as a gift, mm -hmm. and she let me borrow it for this trip. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that. And like I mentioned before, any of those of you who are watching, if you wrote a family statement that you'd like to share with us, please call into our uh, phone number and let us know because we'd love to hear what some other kids around the country have to say about their family statements. Uh, we're also going to hear from another student here in D.C. Uh, Jacob is outside with Dwayne, and he'd like to share his family statement with us. Jacob? Great. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, we're outside. I've been joined by Jacob. Jacob, would you like to introduce yourself and share your family statement with us? Ha em da Jacob Sotai Aka. I said, hi, how are you? My name is Jacob Sotai in Kiowa. And this represents my family because my last name is Sotai and Kiowa means hatchet or, or tomahawk. Great. Thank you, Jacob. Back to you, Jenny. Okay. Uh, great. We uh, also wanted to, to talk about, um, say, well, if there's anybody else who has a, a family statement that they want to share, again, please send it on in. We are going to, next we're going to go to the session, to the section where we, look at the east um, and we're going to look at some video and we're going to ha have Glenn intro that for us. Let's talk a little bit again and thanks Jenny. Let's talk about that family tree because um, Casey was talking about her family tree and, and so we'll reveal to everybody out there that, that you and Casey are brother and sister, right? Yeah, we are. Okay, and we've now I've seen how you guys act around each other for the past week. So she talked about some branches of her family tree are out far and some are close together. Where would you put the two of you? Um, close together. Very close together, wouldn't you say? You know, Logan was telling me that he does most of his sister's chores. So that, that shows you, how, that shows you how, how close they are. So we want to remind you that this is your field trip out there. It's really up to you to get involved, right? And how does everybody, Logan, get involved out there? You can call the number at the bottom of your screen, or you can email, and one of our experts will email uh, give you um, your answer or you can email us and just look around at the website that's right we want to remind you you can call in we'll take some questions live on the air you can email questions in we have a bank of experts and we may actually read some of those email questions on the air and then again the website also has some interactive lesson plans and games for you to look through to help uh, you expand on this experience using the national museum of the american indian as a great tool for learning here today well, as we talked about, we talked about those cardinal directions. And what are they again? Um, north, south, east, and west. All right. And we said that the sun rises in the east. So that seems like a good direction for us to start our show, doesn't it? Right. All right. Let's get started in the east. Hi, Athena and I are now in the uh, 
eastern uh, part of the landscape. This is the wetland area of the landscape. And uh, these cardinal direction markers, we're standing behind the eastern cardinal direction marker, and each one of these stones is directly linked to the center of the building, the center space where Glenn and Logan are, the center of the Potomac. So if you drew a line directly from the center of the Potomac space straight to the east, you would, you would draw a line right through this particular stone. And the other thing that these stones do, in addition to marking the cardinal directions out in the landscape, is they also serve as metaphors for people of the Americas and people from the four directions. And it's a way of, of showing that the museum is working with Native people from across the Americas and, and reaching out to various communities. So this particular stone um, came from a, a local place, and, and Athena, you might be able to tell us where that, that is. It came from Sugarloaf Mountain in Maryland. And what kind of stone is this? It's kind of got a white color to it. What kind of stone is it? I believe it's called a quartzite. Very good. And it's it's kind of a big stone. Can you tell us how much this particular stone weighs? 5,000 pounds. Very good. And uh, some of these stones are really old. This stone is, is very old. Can you tell us how old this stone is? 544 million years old. Very good. And I should mention that the museum worked directly with the Virginia Council on Indians and the Maryland Commission of Indian Affairs on selecting this particular stone. And there's kind of an interesting story that happened when um, this uh, stone was first moved from its original location. You want to tell us about that? Um, when they were moving the branches and getting it, them out of the way, a whole bunch of butterflies came out from behind it, and that's how they knew that they picked the right rock. Right, so it was a good indication that this was, this was definitely the stone for this particular location out here in the landscape. Back to you, Glenn and Logan. Okay, thanks a lot uh, for, to Dwayne and Athena out there talking about the Eastern Rock. Again, we want to remind you that uh, this is your field trip, so pick up the phone or get online and call in. Those are two ways you can interact with this show. It is live and interactive, and we're here to try to answer your questions. Now, uh, but first, uh, we're talking about the East right now, so let's learn about some Indians from the East. We have um, Cynthia and John in the Pamunkey exhibit. Hi, you guys. Hi. Um we're, um, the Pamunkey tribe is located in the east, about 125 miles south of Washington, D.C. And before we start talking about powder, pottery, we're going to say a little bit about how the community exhibits were developed. Can you let us know, John? Um, some of the people in the museum went around to community members and like they put their input into the museum, some of the exhibits, all the exhibits throughout the museum. That's right. Uh, we did what is called community curation. The curators work with community representatives to develop these exhibits. And one of the things that was developed in the Pamunkey Tribe exhibit is the section on pottery, what we, which we have right here. Um, John and I have been talking a little bit about this, and John made an excellent observation about one of the plates in the, in the case. Can you let us know about that, John? Well, one of the plates has, like, people on it, and, like, one has, like, a, a stick coming out of their back, and one has, like, one coming out of their head, and the one with the um, stick coming out of their back represents Europeans, and the other represents Native Americans, and the um, almost like a peace treaty between the two, and I thought that was really cool symbolism. Yeah, that's a good observation. The plate, it has pictographs on it that depict the, the treaty and the relationship between the Pamunkey and England. Uh, pictographs are a good way about communicating messages, and that's one of the ways that the Pamunkey have chosen to, to design their pottery. Um, we've also talked a little bit about the transition of pottery styles, um, so let us know a little bit about that, John. Most of the pottery on the bottom here has like a nat like a natural color to it. It's like not painted or glazed, and like as we go further up, like it starts to get fancier. Start like painting it, and then as you can see up here, um, they actually have like paints on them. They're glazed, and they just got like fancier. Yeah, that's right. The the pottery at the bottom is primarily used for utilitarian or um, as containers to hold various things. And as time went along, the Pamunkey uh, made pottery to sell to tourists. And that's when you start to see commercial paints being used um, in different colors and then glazes to make the pots shiny because um, this was just more appealing to tourists um, to see this kind of pottery. But one of the changes you see is what, John? What's one of the changes we see in one of some of the more contemporary pottery on the top? Um, like they tried to go back to more of their traditional ways with um, like not having glazing 
or painting on them. Yeah, that's right. You see these larger pots on the top. They're, they're, they just have the natural color of the clay. And another interesting thing about the Pamunkey pottery is that there's been a change in who's making the pottery. Traditionally, it was Pamunkey women. And uh, today, you see uh, men starting to make pots. Um, the pots on top, the naturally colored ones, those are made by an artist named Kevin Brown, um, who, who's um, um, you know, an active artist in the community today. Later on, we'll be talking about the Kalinago, which is in some ways related to what's um, going on here with the Pamunkey, because as I stated, um, the pots are made primarily um, in earlier, in contemporary times, primarily for to sell to tourists. And that's something that's really um, important um, is in establishing a market for native arts and crafts so that um, native peoples can continue the traditions. Um, what are some of the crafts um, that you create um, in your tribe? The Oneida like to do a lot of a lot of beadwork, and they can make it to keep for themselves, or give it away, or sell it. Are there any particular crafts that you make, John? I make bracelets, and I can also do like beading. Oh, well, that's great. Um, it's a it's youth like this that you know help perpetuate native traditions. Well, right now we're going to go into a community story on the Pamunkey where you'll learn more about their history and their traditions. We have a long history. It goes back to, uh, we know at least 10 to 11,000 years right in this one spot. We were a sovereign nation before the English ever got here. Without that sovereignty, uh, we wouldn't have a reservation any longer. The most recent treaty, which is still in effect, was signed in 1677, and it has been taken over by the state of Virginia and still honored in the same, in the same fashion. The original treaty called for the Indians to pay a gratuity, and the gratuity now has been generally gained. And that is paid to the uh, governor of Virginia every year, the day before Thanksgiving. Now, Virginia's American Indians have played a pivotal role in our shared history. That ceremony in itself goes a long ways to maintaining our sovereignty. All the chiefs what they do. Until I moved here 20 some years ago, uh, I always lived in a city. I don't believe you could pay me to go back to the city now. It's just a very beautiful, peaceful place to live. Hi, everybody. We're back. And right now we have a, call, a caller on the line. Susan from Wisconsin. What's your question? Hello? Go ahead, yeah. Susan. Hi. Um, I was just wanted to make some remarks on what you were saying as far as what being a native means. Okay, go ahead. Um, I was uh, raised on the Ojibwa Reservation in Lance, Michigan. It's a zebra reservation. And I was raised with my grandparents, and we were taught that um, being a native was a way of life and a way of your heart, seeing each other as one, and that's what made us whole. Um, and it made us more strong spiritually as seeing each other as one and being whole. We always look to each other for a stronghold. And when we are weak, we see our strength in another person. Um, I just wanted to call and give some, you know, different opinions on what being made of it. So, thanks well, for taking my call. Thank you very much, Susan, for calling in. As Jenny said earlier, a lot of different people have different perspectives on what it means to be Native, so we just have another one. Yes, Okay, we, uh, we have a call now from uh, Jimmy in Ohio. Jimmy, go ahead. Hi, how old is the big rock? Okay, how old is the big rock? And that you, he must be talking about the eastern rock that we saw outside. Um, so can we go outside to Dwayne and uh, answer that question? Dwayne? Yeah, we... Uh, oh, the eastern rock that we were at before, that, that one is 544 million years old, so that's a really old rock. And then this one that we're uh, behind right now, you want to tell us how, how old this one is? This one is about 
about four billion years old. Yeah, so this is the oldest of the four cardinal direction markers, and, and uh, we'll talk about this one in a few minutes. Back to you. Okay, great. So uh, now let's go over to uh, Jenny. I think Jenny has some questions over in the classroom, right? Yep. Jenny, what? Hi, Jenny. Uh, hi, thanks. We have, a couple, we have a question from one of our students here in the, from the Hardy Middle School classroom. Um, Amanda, could you uh, introduce our student? My name is Stacia. What's your question? My question is, what type of things were pottery used for in the Indian tribes? Okay, that's a great question. What kinds of things was potter, were pottery used for? And Cynthia and John talked a little bit about the Pamunkey pottery upstairs. But Native American people from all over the Western Hemisphere have made pottery of different kinds uh, for many different reasons. Pottery could be used for storage for food, could be used for water containers, or maybe for storing other things as well. Pots come in all different sizes, small and large. Um, I, so that's a great question. Thanks for asking. We have another question. Um, Nikita from California. Go ahead. What's your question? Nikita? Yeah? Do you have a question for us? Yeah. Okay. What is it? How did the first Indians know how to survive? How did the first Indians know how to survive? That's a great question. Um, maybe we could ask Logan if he could try to give an answer to that question. Logan, you want to try to answer Nikita's question for us? Sure. Um, there are very many different ways that tribes make the creation story. But I, I believe in, I don't really believe in one. I believe in all of them. That's a really good question, by the way. Um, I, I think that they survived by the creator's teachings, which was this, which I call at my school the seven core values. It's, it's um, respect, truth, love, humility, honesty, wisdom, and I forgot the other one. All right. We got oh. six out of seven. Yeah, we got though. six out of seven. <laughs> right. But, but they're, I think that's how they survived. So what else would they do to survive? They would, uh, how would they gather their food? They would probably hunt, just like, just like they, they did earlier on. Okay. So the people hunted. What else did they do? They probably fished. They probably went spear fishing. And they probably um, gathered food, like wild rice and all this other stuff. All right. And then also at, at later on, Native peoples began to grow crops, right? Right. And d corns, beans, and squash, those are three very important crops to the Native Americans. Is that right? Yes. Those are the three sisters to the Native Americans. Okay. So now uh, we talked earlier about you could not only call in, but you could email a question. And Jared has a question for us in the forum, right? Yeah. Jared, what's, what, what question do you have there? Hey, Logan. Uh, we have a couple of good questions coming in on the forum, and Hannah has one for us. Tyler from Highland Heights would like to know how long it took to build the museum. And our experts responded to Tyler by saying that the museum broke ground in 1999, but actually it took about three and a half years to complete the building. Back to you. Okay, thanks very much. What we want to do now is we want to talk a little bit. We've seen some pottery right now, and we know that the pottery was used for what? Like carrying water? Are, um, probably gathering food and um, probably gathering dried meat. Okay, so now let's learn a little bit more about containers. Uh, we've got a container activity, right? Yes, with Jenny and DJ. I think they're going to talk about containers. Okay, back over to you guys. Great, thanks, Logan. Uh, I'm here with DJ. We're going to talk about some containers, but before we do that, we have one other question from our students here from Hardy. Amanda, why don't you introduce our student? Alexander. What's your question? For how long have uh, Indian tribes made pottery? That's a great question, Alexander. How long have Indian tribes been making pottery? BJ, do you think you could give an answer to that question? Uh, no, I don't Probably think I Probably for can. a long time, right? Yeah. We have some pieces here that, that, that uh, represent some different kinds of containers. Pottery we've been talking about mostly, and pottery is one of the oldest kinds of containers that, that Native American people made because it comes from natural elements, right? It comes from clay from the ground. Well, uh, we have one pot here. Uh, BJ, why don't you tell us a little bit about this pot? This pot, it came from somewhere, Acoma. Acoma, New Mexico, and it has designs on it or symbols on it that are supposed to represent pieces of nature and art. Okay. What are some of the what are some of the symbols that you see on here? Can you name a few? Well, these symbols up here around the rim would probably represent clouds, and the feathery -ish symbols probably represent feathers for birds. And then we might have some mountains right along there. Okay. Why, BJ? Tell us a little bit about why these symbols might be on this pot. Well, they probably lived in a desertish area, and there's not a whole lot of water there, and so they probably make these 
spots represented for water because they didn't have a whole lot there. Great. And we also we have a student on the phone, Jessica. Are you there, Jessica, from New York? Jessica? Hello. Hello, Jessica. Hey. Hi, Jessica. Are you there? Yes. Yes. Jessica, can you see the pot that I'm holding here? Do you see this? No? Yes. Yes. Can you tell me, what are some of the things that you see on this pot? Um, do you can see, you repeat that? Can you tell me what colors you see on this pot? What are some of the colors on the pot? I no? can't understand you. Okay, I'm sorry. Jessica, if you have a question, maybe you can tell us what your question is. Oh, my question. Where are all the tribes one tribe at one time. Where, say that again, Jessica? Where all tri the tribes, one tribe at one time. Were all the tribes one tribe at one point in time? That's a good question. At one, at one time. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Actually, uh, they, they weren't all, all Native American people come from different uh, places. They all have their own creation stories and their own histories. And so not all Native American people were one tribe at one time. That's a great question, Jessica. Thanks for, thanks for calling in. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the pots. We noticed on here that these are kind of natural earthy colors, right? Yeah. Can you tell us about where these colors might have come from? Natural resources, maybe dirt, bark. So from rock, from stone or, or mineral pigments that yep. they might have come from. Great, we have a couple of other containers here that I want to take a look at. Um, BJ, tell us a little bit about this container. This container, it's made out of birch bark, and it's got a little design on the top of it of a flower, and the flower was made out of dyed porc porcupine quills. That's right, dyed porcupine quills. And the uh, birch bark containers are a great thing to make container uh, to make uh, containers out of because birch bark uh, is rot resistant and it also could be made waterproof. So this is a container that could have, it's a little small, so I don't know necessarily what it would be used for, but birch bark could be used to make everything from little containers to boats to, to big containers that might hold water. We have one other container I want to take a quick look at. BJ, tell us what this is. This is a parflesh. It is made out of buffalo hide and it's used for carrying probably dry meats, food, clothes, and any other thing that you could probably fit in it. Okay, so par this is, are par flushes all this size or do they come in different sizes? No, they come in a variety of sizes. They come in a variety of sizes. BJ, uh, I wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit about our trip to the Cultural Resources Center. This weekend we went with the students to the Cultural Resources Center, which is where the museum's collection is stored, and we looked at some containers. What are some of the things we saw there and what was one of your favorite things? Well, we saw Baskets, baskets, uh, baby carriages, boxes, bowls. Mm -hmm. So we saw a lot of things. What was one of your favorite? Probably the smallest basket. The smallest basket. How big was it? About the size of. A it was about. It's true. It was very small. And, and was there anything else that you liked? Probably the largest. The basket largest. Too. And how big was that one? It, it could fit two or three people in it. That's right. It was pretty big. Okay. Let's see. Do we have any? Do we have one more? Question from our students here, uh, our Hardy Middle School students. Why don't we take the one down here on the end, Amanda? This one? Take the one down here on the end, Amanda. Thank you. What's your name? Alex. How long did it take them to make the pottery? Alex, how, Alex asked how long it took to make the pottery. Uh, it depends, Alex, that's a good question. It depends on what kind of thing you're making. If you're making something very small, it could take a long time because it might be harder to make something small but it also probably takes a long time to make something big. Each pot is made by hand, so it, uh, the amount of time that's put into it is reflected in the quality of the pot. So um, if, you, if you can imagine having to build something from scratch by hand, it would take a, quite a while. We want to look, now we've talked about the East. Cynthia and John talked about the Pamunkey people who live here in Southern Virginia, and now we're gonna go ahead and move north. We're gonna talk about some different communities and people from the Northern part of the Western Hemisphere. Hi, we're now on the uh, north side of the building. 
Uh, we're directly across from the National Mall, which is right across the street. And we're standing next to the uh, Northern Cardinal Direction Marker. And as I said earlier, if you were to take a, uh, a line, draw a line from this stone directly behind us, you'd end up in the center point of the Potomac space, which is pretty much the center of the museum. So this is on the north side of the building. We're in the hardwood forest area of the landscape. You can see some of the trees around us here. And um, Jacob, could you tell us, this is the oldest of the four cardinal direction markers. Could you tell us how old this particular stone is? It's about four billion years old. Now, if you heard, we said billion years old. So this is one of the oldest stones uh, on the planet Earth. It's four billion years old. And this came from a pretty cold place. Could you tell us where this stone came from? This came from the Northwest Territories in Canada. Right. So it was, it's really far north where this particular stone came from. And the museum worked with the Dagrib community in selecting this particular stone. Now, this one, even though it's the oldest stone, it's probably the smallest, or it is the smallest, of the four cardinal direction markers. And could you tell us roughly how much this stone weighs? It weighs about 2,000 pounds. Yeah, so it's kind of a, it's a smallish stone, and a lot of people don't realize it's out here in the landscape, but it's very important as a cardinal direction marker. And finally, Jacob, could you tell us what kind of stone this is? It's a nice rock. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of like, it's a form of granite, and you see a lot of granite used uh, throughout the design of the museum. It came from the shore of Acasta Lake, which is uh, near Yellowknife, Canada. So that's it on the Northern Cardinal Direction Marker. Back to you, Glenn and Logan. Okay, thanks, guys. We have a caller on the line, and the caller is Logan? Cor Cornia from Oklahoma. Karina, Karina from, from Ohio. Ohio. Go ahead, Karina. Hi, my question is that um, um, do the, on the pottery, do different shapes, geometric shapes, mean different things? On the pottery, do different geometric shapes mean different things? That is a great question. So uh, let's send this one over to uh, Cynthia. She's with John, and where are they again? They're in the, I do believe that they're still in the, the Pamunkey exhibit. That's they're right. Cynthia and John? Hi, um, that's a great question, Karina. Um, the pottery, it, it really depends because certain pot shapes were primarily for utilitarian pur purposes. If you had a certain shape of a pot, it might be to carry water, or if it, would, it was just sort of an open bowl, it might be used to, to, to hold food. Um, and I think maybe you might have been also asking about designs on pottery, um, certain shapes of, or designs on pottery. Uh, yes, um, these designs have particular significance um, depend from tribe to tribe. It really depends. For example, in the Pueblos where I'm from, certain designs mean um, are symbolize clouds or rain or um, other elements in nature. So certainly the shapes and designs have significance in Native American and culture and pottery. Thanks for that question. Okay, thanks a lot for that question. We're going to take a look now at one of the tribes from the north. Yes, we are. We're going to look at the Iglulik community um, oh. video, I guess. All right, let's take a look. My name is Theoklikumak. I was born in Iglulik, which is right behind me. Iglulik has a population of about 1,600 people, of which it, about 80% is Inuit. And being Inuit, it's a very cultural community. And at this time of year, which is spring, we have 24 hours sunlight. The sun rose about, let's say, May, May the 19th, and it won't set again until early August. So it's, it's up 24 hours a day. Time, as we know it, was introduced to us. Prior to the, to the introduction of the timepiece, time would be uh, structured in that travel was during the cool part of the day. It doesn't get dark, but it's on or about midnight. There's a seal over there on the sea ice. And with 12 million seals, you know, they gotta be everywhere. Inuit have eight seasons. So this is one part of the season where it's uh, early spring, in, as we know it, but we have a specific term for that, upanga. This is the time when the snow starts melting on the sea ice, and all the birth layers are collapsing, so therefore you can find the seals a lot faster. 
We have a question. Uh, caller Emily from New York. What is your question, Emily? Hi, Emily. What is your question? Emily, are you are you there, Emily? We um, uh, you just actually saw a video about the Igluluk community and uh, Hannah. Where are the Igluluk people at? They're north of the Arctic. That's right. And so, what are some of the things that you will see in the Igluluk community? You'll probably see their transportation, types of clothes, and their environment. That's right. The Igluluks live in very cold country up north and north of the Arctic in a place called Nunavut. It's actually an island uh, in central Arctic. And some of the things that you will see are, just like you said, transportation, the environment. And uh, one of the things that they really do talk about is the relationship between elders and their youth and some of the storytelling that happens in their community. So we're actually going to um, move right down, back down to the Potomac space and talk with Jenny. And we're also going to meet Vernon. Jenny? Thanks, Jared. Uh, I'm standing here with Vernon. Vernon is uh, one of the staff members here at the museum. Vernon is actually Yupik Eskimo from, from Alaska, which is north. Remember, we're talking about the north. So I want to let Vernon introduce himself. Vernon, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. My name is Vernon Chimeh. Uh, I'm a Yupik Eskimo, originally from the state of Alaska in southwestern Alaska. And um, I'm a cultural arts program specialist here at the uh, museum and do all the fun things of uh, programming all the uh, dancers and performing artists who come to the museum and do their performances here. That's a very important job mm -hmm. here at the museum. Vernon, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, your, the clothes that you're wearing. Vernon, is actually, we're going to actually learn about some dancing with Vernon in a little while, but I think some kids might want to know what you're wearing. Alrighty, um, uh, the type of clothing, it's a, and it's a very small portion of clothing that I'm wearing. It's more lighter clothing that um, we wear in Alaska, except for the boots. My mukluks um, are called geocolics, and these are men's boots that we use in, within the Yupik culture. And then I also have these gloves that are beaded and also have um, hide and made of um, otter, uh, land otter. And then I also have this top here. It's called the Qasbuk, and it's a more modern, um, modified version of the skin um, jackets that we would wear within our culture. And we have to wear lots of clothing, and it's pretty uh, much practical clothing that you would wear in the cold weather. Right, but not in the really cold weather. Not in the really cold weather. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, kids at home, we're going to take some time and now work with Vernon. He's going to teach us about a Yupik dance, which I mentioned before. So why don't, in your classrooms, if everybody could stand up, you'll get a chance to dance along with us here at the museum. If you keep an eye on what Vernon's doing, he's going to teach us a dance about walrus cutting, right? Yes, about okay. walrus cutting. Uh -huh. Okay. And we have our students here from Hardy Middle School. Vernon, why don't you step over here and you can start telling us a little bit about the dance and okay. we'll get the students in play. All right. The, uh, the dance that we'll be performing today is going to be about walrus cutting and we will be making the motions of walrus cutting and dance is um, a part of, a big part of the Yupik culture and pretty much a part of the, all the Eskimo cultures throughout the um, circumpolar world and what they will uh, use dance in is um, entertainment and there's a part of it that is used for uh, religious or um, supernatural um, uh, types of um, uh, beliefs and that sort of thing and then what um, people will do is they will tell stories through song and dance because in the uh, Eskimo cultures we never had a written form of language and so everything that was um, uh, experienced in life would be put into a song and um, then there's others that are done for spe special ceremonies that we uh, do in private but then these um, public dances that we do like the one we're going to be learning today is called the walrus cutting dance and um, uh, Eskimo dance is about symmetry, so you'll do a movement on one side. If you do a movement on one side, you have to do the movement on the other side. And on this particular dance, there's the only one um, pretty much word that we all have to remember, and it's ya ah So that's the only word that you're going to have to do. The, the uh, motions tell the dance, and then so we're going to do, we're going to cut the walrus. Cut the walrus. It's a hot day, so you're going to wipe your forehead. Then you're going to take the meat, and then you're going to hang it up to dry. So come on, uh, children, let's um, start the dance. Okay, remember? 
with the right hand first. Okay, let's go. One more time. Great. Good job. Thank you, Vernon. We want if we can have all the students stay here. Uh, we might see if there's any other questions for Vernon. And Amanda has a microphone. Um, if one of our students has a question. How about this young man right here? What's your name? My name is Jaquan, and my question is, do you have like a holiday or a celebration for the walrus? The question uh, is, does he, do, do you think people have a, a holiday or a celebration for the walrus? Yeah, well, we have celebrations that um, might be a little different than um, we do in the Western uh, culture, but we do have um, celebrations that celebrate our hunting and gathering seasons and that sort of thing, so that would fall into that category. He was asking if we had a special celebration for walrus, but we would all lump it into hunting and gathering celebrations. Are there any other questions? How about we take this other, the other one here? Malcolm, and my question is, what tribe are you from? What, can you say your question again? What tribe are you from? What tribe? Uh, Vernon, can you tell us about what tribe you're okay, from? Okay, he's asking what tribe I'm from. And in Alaska, we have 11 different culture groups. There's not just one. Sometimes when folks think about Alaska, they think there's just Eskimos. But there's five Eskimo culture groups and six uh, Indian groups. And I'm from the uh, Yupik culture group. And Yupik means real person. So I'm from the real people tribe. That's great. Thanks so much, Vernon. I think we also have a question from Carla uh, in Nevada. Carla? Oh, I'm sorry, California. Carla, are you there? Carla, do you have a question yes. for us? No. What's your question, Carla? Um, do the pictures on the pot tell a story? Do the pictures on the pot tell a story? That's a good question. Sometimes pictures on containers and on pots do tell stories. The same way Vernon was telling a story through his dance, there are a lot of different ways that stories can be told that aren't just about um, that, that don't just come out, out of our mouths. We can tell stories by drawing pictures, and sometimes pictures are drawn on our clothes or on pots or other containers. Sometimes they're drawn on, uh, on uh, stones or, other, or, or rocks. So, yeah, sometimes they do tell stories. I think the pot that we showed you here, I don't think that that's actually a story, but that's a great question. Thanks, Carla. Um, we have a, another caller on the line. Oh, I'm sorry, Glenn. Okay, thanks, Jenny. We want to remind you, you've heard us taking some calls from some people. You can uh, call in, and we will ask if you, if you call in. We may ask you or answer your question live on the air. And there's another way people can get involved as well, right? Right. You can email us on our address at the, at the bottom of your street, screen, or you can, um, and one of our experts will tell you the answer to your question, or you could just look around. And we may actually talk about some of those questions live on the air if you email us a question, right? Right. And I think we've got one of those now, don't we? Yes, I think we do. What? Jared, I think, has one. Right? Yeah, let's go to Jared. Hi, Glenn. Hi, Logan. We have a question in from Casey. And Hannah, would you ask that question? Casey would like to know if it's hard to walk through the T-shaped doors. Now, Casey is referring to T-shaped doors of the Pueblo Indians in the desert southwest. And their doorways are actually shaped as a, in a T-shaped form. And the, the doorways are designed actually to keep the cold weather out in the winter and the hot weather out in the summer. And you actually have to step over a short wall located at the base of the doorway. So you can't actually walk through the door. You have to step over the wall to make it through. Back to you, Glenn. OK, great. So again, you, this is your field trip out there. We want you to get involved, right? right. So um, we've, got, we've got another form question right now. I think we do. Where are we going? Let's go to John and Cynthia, OK? OK, John. It says, do a lot of Native Americans today still speak their language fluently at their household and school? The answer is absolutely. One of the, one of the tribes that I'm aware of that really in, that entitles their language is the Navajo, about out of Arizona and New Mexico. Also, there are 
noted as being one of the biggest tribes in North America. Okay, great, great. Thanks for those questions. Keep those questions coming in, whether it's via email or on the phone. In fact, right now we have Shalissa from Missouri on the phone. Shalissa, go ahead with your question. Hi. Um, I was wondering how they tell the age of the rocks. How do they tell the age of the rocks? Who's our rock expert today? Jared. Right. Jared, do you know the answer to that question? Let's Me, go to Dwayne. 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 Sorry. Yeah, I'm not exactly the rock expert, but uh, we did have geologists working with us on this project, and geologists from the Museum of Natural History are able to look at these rocks and compare them to the period that they were from, and, and judging by the area that they're from, they're able to tell the history of the rock and how old it is. So that's how we're able to, to know the age of the stones. We can't predict it exactly, but um, we, get, we can get pretty close, and that's geologists who, who are able to help us with that information. Okay, and we saw uh, Dwayne out there. He was standing with Athena, and they are by the South Rock. And so, so far, we've talked about what two directions? The east and the north. The east and the north. And so now where are we going? We're probably going to the south one. That's right. Let's get going on the south direction. Hi, we're now on the south side of the building. This uh, is the crop and meadow area of the landscape. Behind us is actually a crop area where this spring we're going to be planting corn, beans, squash, and tobacco. And as Logan said earlier, corn, beans, and squash are known as the three sisters to Native communities. And tobacco is also an important crop because it's used in ceremonies. And uh, so we're going to grow all those crops directly behind us. Athena and I are standing next to the southern cardinal direction marker. And if you were to draw a line from this stone, through the building, you would end up again in the center line or the center point of the Potomac space inside the building. And uh, this stone is from a, very, a location very far south. You want to tell us where this stone's from? <clears throat> I believe it's from Muscle Bay, Chile. That's correct. It's, it's all the way from southern Chile, uh, near a body of water named, called Muscle Bay. And this is a fairly large stone. You can see it's practically hiding us entirely. And uh, this particular stone, uh, what, how, how much does this one weigh? This is the biggest one, isn't it? Yeah. It's 65 to 145 million years old. Right, so that's the age. You can see it's got a range, age range of 65 to 145 million years. So as I said, we can't pinpoint some of the ages exactly. Now this one, what is the weight of this one? How I much does it weigh? 7,000. Yeah, so this one's 7,000 pounds. You remember the northern stone was only 2,000 pounds. So this is definitely the largest one. The museum worked with the Yagan community from southern Chile in selecting this stone. And it was interesting in, in talking to community members uh, some of the older members of the community remember climbing on this stone as children. And now when, when you see it outside the museum, sometimes we see some of our younger visitors climbing on the stone, and it's kind of, uh, I think the stone is kind of <laughs> takes kindly to have, having people climb on it because it's used to that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, Athena has a, has a little story to tell. Sometimes you find some interesting things under rock, some things you don't necessarily want to find, like worms. But there was a story about what they found under this rock when they moved it. What's that about? Um, when they were moving it, um, they found mussels under the, the rock. Yeah, so there were all sorts of shells underneath this rock, and, and they must have been there for, for many, many, many years because this was found near a body of water. So it tells you sort of some, somewhat about the location of the rock and, and what was underneath it. So back to you, Glenn and Logan. We're done here on the south side. Okay, thanks, guys. We have another caller on the line. Michael from California, I believe. Michael, what's your question? Uh, my question is, what is the most economic backbone of Indian American. What is the economic background of most American Indians? Is that your question? No. What is the most economic backbone of Indian American? Oh, what is the uh, economic backbone of uh, American Indians? Uh, yep. Jenny, why don't you uh, take that question for us? Okay, that's a good question, Michael. Uh, American Indian people actually uh, have a lot, there's a lot of business that American Indian people are involved in. And it ranges everything from development of agricultural products and, and crops that tribes uh, actively grow and sell. It also sometimes tobacco and, and other crops like that. Also, casinos are one thing that, that some tribes are involved in, but that's a very 
small minority of the number of tribes who have a large income from casinos. Um, the most Native American tribes do not uh, have casinos on their on their reservations, and, and those few that do, um, a number of them are out here in the eastern part of the United States. But tribes have a lot of different ways that they try to support their communities, and uh, sometimes they have things that they that they sell or things that they make and they sell, and, and so those are some of the ways that they that they support themselves. Uh, we are also, we, we're here in the south, as uh, Duane and Athena were telling us a little bit about the southern stone, and uh, so I wanted to introduce to the, all of our viewers another museum person, another staff person here from the museum. Jose Montano is one of the cultural interpreters in the museum, and he is a, an Aymara Indian from Bolivia. And Jose is going to talk with us today and tell us a little bit about himself and his community. Jose, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little about where you're from. Thank you. My name is Jose Montaño. I am Aymara from La Paz, Bolivia, South America. In my country, the Aymaras and Quechua people, and they are spiritually and economically tied to the land, which is among the most varied in the, in the world and numerous uh, distinct uh, environmental zones that determine the altitude and all the annual uh, celebrations of dry and the wet uh, cycles. So the seasons and the land are an important part of your, of your culture and your community in Bolivia? Yes, for all these activities like planting, harvest, cleaning the fields and weavings and as well the ceremonies are the by according the solar calendar. Okay. And Jose actually has worked with our students here from Hardy Middle School and they made some flutes. If there are any students who are watching who made flutes in your classroom, made the did the straw flute activity, go ahead and get your flutes out and get them ready. Because Jose's gonna tell us a little about a little bit about the instruments that he brought here and then he's gonna give us a chance to to hear a song from the students who are from Hardy Middle School and those of you who are watching can also play along with the students here. But while everybody's getting their flutes out and getting ready, Jose, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, the instruments that you brought here. These pan pipes are called siku, correct? Yes. Well, in general, all the wind instruments of the high plains is played on wind and percussion instruments. All the wind instruments of the high plains is played with families of instruments reflecting the families of the communities. Just like human families, which consist of parents and children of various ages, and each instrumental family is made up of instruments of various sizes. So we call instrumental families, and each instrumental family always is played by 12 or more musicians. As well, each instrumental family is played with a particular type of drums. Great, and so you were explaining to us before that each of these uh, instruments, the, the siku is made up of two pieces, the arca and the ira, and those two pieces need to be played together in cooperation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I will explain, but before to play the, I mean to explain the pump pies, uh, how about if I play a song? Oh, moment? that'd be great. Okay, Jose uh, is going to play a song yes. for us. And um, this instrument is called wakatinti in Aymara language, have three holes, two in the front, one in the back. And it's played together with this drum, it's called in Aymara language, a wankara. And the wind instrument represent all the elements from the sky. The drum are symbol of the earth. So when this play together, represent the cosmic wholeness. So I will play a little bit, and so please, I will ask the students to help us with us with the hands. Please, hands, everyone.
can you you wanna um that was that was wonderful. Thank yeah, you for sharing that with us. This is some example of the instruments because in the rural areas each community has different the type of instruments and always play according to the solar calendar for okay. planting, harvest. So About planting the, and harvesting are an important part yeah. of they, they play a role in the music. About pan pipes. And the pan pipes are called sikus in the Aymara language. The sikus have two parts the arca and the ira. The notes of the scale are distributed alternately between the arca and the ira. Do, re, mi, fa, sol. Example. The tradition in my country, two musicians play one instrument. One person to play the arca, the other person to play the ira. The value about these musical instruments is the cooperation, and the way we play these musical instruments reflect the system and the rural areas. So, so cooperation is an important part of this, and, and the lesson that we did with Jose, where students each, the students divided in half, half of them made arcas and half of them made iras. Those of you who are watching in your classrooms, if you have your flutes, Go ahead and get them out and get them ready. We want to make sure that you get a chance to try to play with Jose while he's here. All right. We will demonstrate this uh, cooperation technique. So we will, a group already has divided in two groups. Okay. So we will, I hope everybody is ready. Okay. All Students, right. we're going to go ahead and try to play. All right. So please, together, can you say, Sikus. Sikus. Arca. Arca. Ira. Yeah. Ready? All right. It's slow, please. All right. Two, three, four. Thank you very much for doing that. We wanna, I wanted to have one quick question, if you could take just a, a, a quick second to tell us about the clothes that you're wearing. Well, um, what I have here is called chuspa, and it's uh, for people use for care sometimes, uh, medicinal plants or personal things. I have as well this other uh, small chuspa, it's called, it's for uh, care coca leaves. Okay, so your bags are for carrying medicinal plants yes. or, or, or coca leaves? And the coca leaves are sacred uh, medicinal plants okay. we use for ceremonies, but as well for uh, care of health. Okay, so um, for, for your health, for good health. Yes, and as well we have the uh, luchu, and uh, so it's uh, all the colors as well are related with the activities uh, for planting, harvest, and the symbols as well are related with the, the the, the whole system and itself. Great. Thanks so much, Jose. I really appreciate your sharing your music and your instruments with us today. I want to go ahead and, and pass it up to Cynthia and John upstairs in the Pamunkey exhibit. Cynthia? Thanks, Genevieve. Uh, we're here talking today about the Kalinago, who are also from the south. Um, they live in a place called Carib Territory, which is located on the island of Dominica in the Caribbean. John, can you share an interesting historical fact about the Kalinago? They were one of the first groups that encountered Columbus. Yeah, that's right. Um, um, they were one of the first groups that Columbus encountered, and at the time, um, way back in history, they were called the Carib. Um, today, they're known as the Kalinago, which is the name of their the name of their ancestors. Um, one of the important things to know about the 
Kalinago is that um, they live in a very beautiful place. Um, you'll see that in the exhibit. Um, they um, practice basketry. Uh, they have cultural groups. Um, what are the names of a couple of their cultural groups, Sean? Karina and Karifuna. Yes, um, the Karina and Karifuna are youth cultural groups in Carib territory. Um, they they practice um, music, dance. Um, they make traditional attire, and um, they perform for educational purposes as well as for tourists. Um, tourist tourism is an important part of the economy in Carib territory. Uh, the like I said, the um, Karifuna and the um, Karina groups perform for tourists, and then they make baskets as well. Um, baskets are an important part of the um, cultural identity of the uh, Kalinago. John, can you let us know why it might, why it's important for Native peoples to learn their, their cultural traditions? For me? Because if they don't, I think that their language and culture and stuff like that might die out. Yeah, that's right. It's really important for Native peoples to continue their cultural tra tra traditions as we move into the 21st century. Um, right now, we're going to go to a story on the Kalinago where you can learn more about their cultural identity. I think that banana production to them is important, more important than tourism, because it's something that they've been used to over the years, and um, they, they feel that they can continue on change. However, we know that there's got to be changes. We've seen a decline in the banana industry, and a number of farmers have left the industry. There is space now for something else, and it is felt that, that um, tourism could fill, the, fill in that space and, and bring an income for the Caribbean. The whole increase of tourism to the community have affected the cultural interest of younger people. They see an economic thing in it. We go and dance with the visitors. We get some money at the end of the month. That's cool. Because, because what happens is, is, is to get the money, they must learn the traditional dances. You see, so it has affected the positive in that sense where we have more young people coming forward wanting to learn and dance those traditional dances. Once they've done it, once they've got into it, they stay with it. We have been in the struggle for a long time. Now we have children go to high school, we have them going into the universities. Now is the time for us to, to ensure that we, that we make a future for them. Now, the, now um, we have a foreign question uh, up with, with Jerry and Hannah. Hey, you guys, what the for, what's the question? Hey, Logan. Hey, Glenn. Hannah? Addington would like to know if Native American languages were written the way they were today or in Egyptian hieroglyph. That's a really good question. One of our experts actually responded by saying that Native languages were actually passed down from generation to generation through oral traditions. Uh, however, that Native languages were sometimes recorded uh, using symbols on animal skins, uh, pieces of tree bark, and rocks to uh, convey meanings. Also, in the early 1800s, there was a Cherokee leader by the name of Sequoia who actually developed the Cherokee syllabary. It's actually an alphabet that is still used today. Back to you, Glenn. Okay, great. Uh, we're going to take some questions now from the children from Hardy School who are here, right? Right. All right, Jenny, take it away. Hey, great. Amanda's out here with our students. Amanda, um, give, we have a question in the audience. What's your name and your question? My name is Dahabina, and my question was, are all of the pipes made out of wood? So this is a question for Jose. Jose, maybe you could answer this question. Are all of the pipes in your siku made out of wood? Well, some instruments, is the pan pipes, we call chaya, as we uh, like a bamboo. It's very light uh, material. But as well, all the instruments we use for bamboo, it's, we call chuki as well, uh, tokoro, and as well, instruments made from wood. So they are made from wood. They're made from yeah. bamboo, which is a kind of wood. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Jose. We have another question in the audience. Um, what's the question here, Amanda? What's your name and your question? My name is Zach, and my question is approximately how many Native American tribes were there? Zach's question is how many Native American tribes were there? Well, that's an interesting question, Zach, because actually there are still Native American tribes here in the United States and all throughout the Western Hemisphere. 
here today. Uh, it's hard to see exactly how many there were before uh, Europeans came to this continent and to the Western Hemisphere, but it's probably safe to say that there were thousands of communities that lived all throughout the Western Hemisphere. Today in the United States, there are over 562 federally recognized tribes. There are a couple of hundred state recognized tribes, and there are also other communities in Canada and in South and Central America that are very actively involved in the places where they live and still have a very strong presence in their communities there uh, where, where they live. Um, those are great questions. Thank you all for, for, for helping out with us that with those questions. We're going to now move to the west. We've talked about the east. We then moved to the, to the north where Vernon taught us about some Yupik dancing. We just learned about south, the south from Jose. Jose is from Bolivia. And now we're going to end up in the west. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and move on to the west. Hi, Jacob and I are now on the west side of the building and we're directly across from the National Air and Space Museum. And we are standing next to the fourth and final marker, cardinal direction marker. This is the western cardinal direction marker. And uh, this came from a fairly exotic place. Jacob, do you want to tell us where it's from? This place, is, this rock is from Hilo, Hawaii. And as I mentioned earlier, all of these stones are connected to the center of the building. And in this particular case, do you want to tell us these, explain these slots in the wall directly behind us? If you follow this rock all the way through these slots, it will lead you straight to the, to the center of the Potomac where Logan and Glenn are. So this is actually a, an architectural feature of the building. It was incorporated into the building. There would be this literal connection between this stone and the center of the building. And this is our youngest of the four cardinal direction markers. How, how old is this particular stone? It's about 400 years old. And what kind of stone is this? This is lava rock. And it, it comes from, uh, as, as he said, it's from Hilo, Hawaii. And uh, the museum worked with the Kapuna community in, in um, selecting this particular stone. And we have a, a story about the stone that we'll get back to a little later. So we're going to go back to Glenn and Logan right now. Okay, thanks, guys. You saw the rock out there that's from Hawaii. We're actually standing next to a Hawaiian boat, right, Logan? Yes, we are. So what are some of the things you think are interesting about this boat? Is that if you look inside of it, it's a lot more deeper than usual boats are. Okay, and what about the outrigger and the float that you see out here? What are those used for? Those are used for keeping the boat balanced. This is a boat that you would normally see where? In the, out in the ocean. Okay, so this is a boat you would see out in the ocean. Now, this is very rare wood. The, the main part of the boat is made out of koa wood. There is not much koa wood left. It's protected. It was normally harvested at two to 5,000 feet above sea level, but now they are no longer allowed to harvest this wood, so Hawaiians will make these boats out of fallen trees. And what did we uh, learn about the length of this boat? This boat's maybe 20 feet long, but what do we, if this were a boat that they were actually using in Hawaii, how long might this boat be? This boat would probably be about 50 to 100 feet. 50 to 100 feet. And typically it would take someone about three months to make a boat like this. So you'd need a lot of patience to build a boat like this, wouldn't you? Yes, you would. Okay, I think we have another forum question. Who's got the forum question for us? I think us? it's Jared. Okay, Jared. if it's still correct to call Native American Indians? That's a really good question. One of our experts responded by that, saying that uh, Native Americans, First Nations, American Indians, those are all actually preferred terms that Native, Native people prefer to call themselves. But more specifically, Native people like to be per called uh, uh, by their tribes. For example, I'm Navajo and Hannah is Kickapoo. So if you know the tribal name of the group, use that name, and that's the best uh, way to address a Native person. Back to you, Glenn. Okay, thanks guys. We're moving right along here. We have one more community story for you. We're going to go to the Hoopa community story. Okay, the Hoopas live out west uh, in the northern part uh, of California. So again, it's keeping with our theme of talking about the western part of the world. My name is Merv George Sr. I'm the religious dance leader for the Hopa Valley Tribe. And this is the village where I'm from here. It's called Taika Milton. We're standing in front of the Huntan Nikau, which is Hoopa word for house, our church house. These houses, these junta, 
are very sacred to us. These in particular have been continuously inhabited for over 10,000 years. Right here we have our Hoopa Brush Dance Pit. This one's been set up to where the people can sit down and look on our, our brush dance. Our uh, medicine woman here in this dance, uh, brush dance, they have to go out and collect plants, things they're going to use to make medicine with here to keep the healing going. They have to go out in the woods to get it. Our local church groups up here decide that we're doing bad things down here. We've had them set up little church groups up there in the middle of town with amplifiers while we're dancing here and they're singing all their church songs over to us here. And it, it kind of makes me sad that, that they do that. You know, they, they should come down and take a look. It's got to be one of these things we got to learn to get along here and, and with everybody, uh, the, the white man, the, the Indian that don't believe in this, but we're doing good here. Yes, we're back at the Western Cardinal Direction Marker, and as I mentioned earlier, the museum worked with the Kapuna community on selecting this particular stone, and the Kapuna have a very uh, special connection to this stone. They, they saw it as being very significant to them, and to the point where they actually believe this, this stone has a spirit, and they gave this stone a name, uh, which is Kanapo, and that uh, to them means that this stone is actually a relative of theirs, and what does that mean to us, uh, Jacob? That we have to return this rock in 20 years back to Hawaii. Right, and the other thing that happened with the selection of all of these stones is in, in working with the communities, there were ceremonies and blessings that were performed uh, by each community with its particular stone to so wish that the, the, the stone would have a safe journey to Washington, D.C., and also that it, we, we also had ceremonies to welcome the stones to, here to D.C. So if you notice in front of this stone, the Hawaiian community actually came and, and performed some prayers and ceremonies with this particular stone, and you can see some of the... Uh, items that were left behind as part of that ceremony. So these are very special rocks to the museum and, and they're a very important part of the landscape. And that's it for the Cardinal Direction Markers. For now we're going to go back to Glenn and Logan. Okay, thanks guys. Well, Logan, it's time for us to review what we've learned today. Yes, we, we've learned about everything that there should be known about this museum. We've learned about all four Cardinal Directions. We've learned about the different communities about, uh, from the, in the museum. And we've also learned about different tribes around the museum. And we've learned about uh, pottery, we've learned about containers, we learned about the boat, music, and dancing. So we really have had a great experience today here, haven't we? Yes, we Would have. Would you guys agree? Yeah. Amanda, Casey, yeah. BJ, all right. We, we want to just uh, remind you all that there will be another electronic field trip coming up next month. And we're going to be live from the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown, New York. Um, examine and take a closer look at the 19th century baseball. We're going to examine 19th century history, a time period that helped shape the current state of our nation through business, communication, immigration, and more. We'll, we'll play a real vintage baseball game with 19th century rules. Quite different than what, how we play today. Just like today, you'll have a chance to call in live with your questions or ask our panel of online experts during uh, questions during the show. Look for an interactive website with lots of great information, games, puzzles, and a lot more launched le next week. That's right. We're going to be live again for the Na National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown, New York on April the 26th. So tune in then. It's going to be a fantastic program. We want to thank you for joining us today for the electronic field trip. We want to thank our sponsors, Ball State University, National Museum of the American Indian, and also Best Buy Children's Foundation, who has just announced they will be funding this program again next year, so we'll be able to bring you more live, interactive electronic field trips. Jenny, thank you, too, to all of your people here at the museum for being great hosts to us this week. We've had a wonderful time. We've learned a lot, and let's go out having a little bit of fun. Jenny? Great. Thanks, Glenn. I want to, before we leave, I want to take a moment to introduce the Aloha Boys. They are going to perform for us. They're here with Ashley also, who's going to do a uh, dance with, uh, along with their music as well. Do you want to tell us where you're from, Glenn? Hi. Um, Ramon Camarillo from Pearl City, Oahu. Isaac Ho'opi'i from Waianae, Oahu. Irv Keha from Waihewa, Oahu. My name is Glenn Hirabayashi from Kauai. And... Hokunani here of Bayashi, my daughter. We'd <laughs> like right. to start with um, a hula. This is called Ka'ulu Vehi Oke Kai. Um, it's a hula dance about picking seaweed, having lots of fun. <laughs> Ke aloha, ei ipo ine me ke 
The beautiful and talented Hokunani. Her name means beautiful star. She is a ninth grader. You know, long before there was Clark Kent, the original Superman in Hawaiian legend was named Maui. Maui had a magic fishing pole and hook, and he fished the islands out of the ocean. And back in those days, the sun flew by really fast. And Maui reached up and grabbed the sun and slowed it down so that the kapa could dry and the crops could grow. And then the fire went out, and mankind had no fire. But Maui came to the rescue and reignited fire for all of us. Here's a story about that mischievous, marvelous, magical Maui. Heroes of this land, the only, only, the ultimate. 